Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the MedTech Impact Podcast, where you get to hear from leaders and innovators who are shaping the future of medical technology. I'm Kyle Cruz. And I'm Richard Mikuljong. And we're your hosts of the show. All right, guys, before we get started, we want to talk about MedDevice Boston coming up this September 25th and 26th at the Boston Convention and Exhibition Center right there in the Seaport District. This show year after year has been amazing. They've actually rebranded from BioMedDevice Boston to MedDevice Boston in an effort to better align with the medical device manufacturing industry. There's going to be all new opportunities for networking, collaboration, learning experiences, and you can get your free expo pass and 20% off the conference by using the code IMPACT, that's I-M-P-A-C-T, at checkout. Click the link in the podcast bio and make sure to see us there. So today on the MedTech Impact podcast, we are delighted to be joined for show number 50, Mike Hugo, patient advocate at Medtronic. Mike, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Well, Mike, we appreciate you being on. I mean, ever since we got to meet back in April at the incredible Mass Medic Symposium, we got to hear your story. It was so inspiring. We've had some back and forth messages over the past few months. And yeah, just absolutely delighted to have you on and share your story. Um, and there's so much to tell. And and so I think it's quite right to set the stage for the audience. And we always normally start with, you know, the problem that innovators are trying to solve. Of course, it's a little bit different in terms of the patient advocacy piece. So maybe you could just share with the audience the condition you're living with today. Yeah, so I have a glioblastoma, which is a brain cancer. And the, the grade I have is the most aggressive of all the grades. The five-year survival rate historically is four to 5%. And I am now 28 months, just about 28 months out with no recurrence and you know, I'm living a life where all the doctors kind of look at me sideways a little bit and say, how you doing that? And I am helping patients, hugging my girls every day and really enjoying every minute of being alive. So it's, it's been in some ways this crazy blessing, but it is kind of this dangerous dark cloud over me that I'm just, we're pushing away and we're living each day my wife likes to say we're yoloing so yolo well mike i mean this is just again truly inspirational to to have you on and thank you so much for being able to you know share the insights to this disease and this condition and, and ultimately it's something that affects nearly a quarter of a million people every year around the world uh, you know it's, I, guess, I guess it's still considered a rare disease but you know it hugely impacts people's lives you know for you personally you know what's kind of been that impact if you want if you're able to share with the audience and, and your life and your health since the diagnosis yeah so i was in the neuroscience world i actually managed uh in the med tech world all the uh neuroscience science products for medtronic at one point or another um deep brain stimulation navigation system they use the navigation system on me and kind of use the fiber tracking advanced stuff so that way i can still beat my wife and kids at Mario Kart and a uh, little, you know, bow and arrow thing. Uh, it, I'm pretty competitive. And if I have, if, if my daughter's in, in front and I have the blue shell, boom, she's, she's getting it. Um, you know, I say that jokingly, basically since I've been di diagnosed, I knew what glioblastoma was and, you know, outside of the, the world here, when my wife and I were, you know, told the diagnosis, it was, I mean, I got hit by a semi, right? She fell on the, on the, on the floor crying. And we didn't know if we had weeks left and, or months left. And after the first couple of days, um, you know, every time I woke up and opened my eyes, um, I was grateful and, and thankful that I was there. So once we kind of got over that initial hurdle and my back was fractured from the, the car accident that, you know, kind of how we discovered I had a brain tumor, um, we started going for solutions, right? And being in the med tech world, we have such 
connections. And if you, if no one's using them, oh, you're missing out. You know, um, I feel like I get with those connections, the best treatment in the world. You know, if the Pope had glioblastoma, he could not get the treatment that I get because of our background. You know, I could pick up the phone and I actually did. I picked up the phone and I said, Hey, Dr. Komatar from the university of Miami, one of the greatest surgeons for brain in the world. And I texted him my video of my scan. And he said, get down here right now. We got you. And that's how my surgery was kind of scheduled and my diagnosis. And when I woke up, it was incredible. I, I mean, the next day I went home with that technology and, you know, I, I mean, I wasn't perfect, but I was very blessed with a minimal, you know, impact to my mental cognitive abilities. So, so grateful that somebody made that uh, technology and minimal impact to my health. And I still get to love my girls and remember things mostly. Yeah, and Kyle, I think, you know, listening to this story, and I'm sure the audience, we can only emphasize with, you know, the impact this has on on Mike and other patients who are going through a similar situation. But uh, again, as you say, Mike, you're, you've are you got this amazing background in the medtech industry, which has allowed you to tap into this incredible innovation that, you know, we all live and breathe every day in terms of wanting to bring this type of technology to market. And and so, Kyle, yeah, it's, it's just kind of interesting, you know, living in this space in the industry and you know, as, as Mike said, you know, having all these connections around us, it can really truly make a difference. Yeah, no. And, and Mike, you know, to Richard's point, it's, it's, uh, it sounds like, you know, while you got this special treatment, you know, you're really motivated, and inspired to really help others, you know, get the special treatment that you've got, you deserve, you know, um, you know, and, and I guess, you know, tell us a little bit more about kind of, um, I think you're background in, in medical device and, and kind of where that all started now and, and how you got into the industry. Um, how did all that work? <laughs> yeah, so I, I started as a mechanical engineer and uh, Stryker interviewed and hired me when I was 20 years old and I was, you know, fresh out of college and started designing beds and uh, stretchers and, and working in that and I love solving problems, but I also, I like to have a conversation and, and work with people instead of just sitting on a CAD desk all day. So I would see these uh, marketing or sales team come, come in and they were having a blast. They made great money and they got to go out and, and kind of have fun in the world while doing their job and solving people's problems. So I was like, man, that sounds amazing. And tried to get into that. They said, no, no, you're an engineer. You can't, can't make the switch from engineering to sales. So I uh, started doing beef jerky sales on the, uh, as a side hustle, um, you know, just kind of learning how to do sales. And eventually I had a tent up at one of the football games for a D1 school. And the president of Stryker came and saw me passing out beef jerky with my little company and he said, I know you're working at Stryker. What are you doing selling beef jerky on a weekend? And I said, this is the company I started. These guys said I needed experience uh, in sales. And so I created a distribution center out of the garage of my house. And he's like, that's your meat. He called it a meat wagon because I had a giant van and it had beef jerky on the side of it. So I would go in the mornings drop off beef jerky at all the grocery stores and stuff like that, make it to work, work all day and then drive home and do a couple sales calls and stuff like that. And eventually went to um, engineering in the spine world uh, in Memphis, Tennessee with Medtronic. And once that product launched on a recall, uh, I got an opportunity to get into sales in Florida and did that for a long time. President's club, all the fun stuff. And, uh, you know, I wanted to make it into management. And so I moved to Colorado um, and did some market development, some sales out there, and eventually came back to Florida as the manager. 
and kind of managed all the neuroscience products at one point in time, the ENT, the advanced energy, deep brain stimulation, navigation, I mean, drills, shunts, everything kind of fell under me at one point. And driving home from the University of Miami after I sponsored one of the events, um, I was, you know, always making that extra phone call to pipeline plan and fill that, you know, funnel lost my consciousness and, you know, jumped my car into a ditch. And from that accident, I, I broke my spine in four places and woke up with, uh, that EMT kind of smashing my window out, um, from the seizure. And it really changed my world. You know, I was, I just turned 37 and I did not see that coming at all. Uh, you know, I've done 11 full Ironmans now. A uh, ton of, you know, half Ironmans, like 30, 40 marathons, you know, super healthy. And, you know, at the end of the day, you get told, hey, you may, you may die in a couple of weeks. And I have little girls. I was like, I mean, it was a definite wake up call and definitely something that I never saw coming. Right. Yeah, especially for someone that's so motivated, so driven, right? You're like, you busted hump in your career to start a sales business on the side to, you know, be in the shape, you know, doing all those, those marathons and triathlons. I mean, you know, the last thing you think, right, is you're going to all of a sudden be impacted by something really ultimately you can't control. And it's, uh, it's, it's tough. And, and, um, you know, I do want to go back though, to, to, cause I think what's really interesting too, is your story about, and, and something we see a lot in med tech, right. Where, you know, the engineers kind of come in, they're the ones that are developing these technologies, right. They see how it's done firsthand. Right. And then that transition, which I find very interesting, right. Because, you know, a sales team might say, Hey, you know, you need to go out and learn how to sell. Well, but there's the other side, like when you're an engineer, you know exactly how it was designed, built, validated, brought to market, right? So like you can speak to it, I feel like, no better than really anyone else. Um, you know, so so I guess like, how, what was your thought? Like, what was your experience, you know, going from the engineering side to the sales side and having that technical business acumen? Well, you know, there is the walking the line of, being, you know, smiling and, you know, doing the, the normal sales, sales part to not get kicked out of the OR and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Um, and well, you know, once I learned that, I, I find that honestly, the surgeons really opened up to me more so than any other rep in there, because we're trying to, you know, solve problems in the middle of the case. And, you know, someone may have hit a giant cement pole and we're trying to help put this patient back together. And it really ends up being an engineering project, right? An, an erector set, so to speak. And so when we would get into a, a pickle, you know, we'd say, well, how, how can we solve this problem? And it got to the point because I did so much of that where they didn't want to do cases without me in tough cases. So I would be flown all over the country. I think I've, I've done cases in 35 different states. And by then I ended up being so good at that portion of, of, of putting the spines back together that I was brought in as an expert. And, you know, the, the surgeons then all looked at me as an expert because I just had so much crazy experience and it was really a way to open the door and, and get trust built versus, Oh, you're, you know, you're a dumb rep and, you know, one time a surgeon was complaining, why the heck is this thing not wider? Why the heck is this point not, you know, X, Y, and Z? And I'm like, I designed that. And let me tell you why, <laughs> you know? And uh, they're like, that, that makes perfect sense. I, I didn't think of that aspect of it. And, it. and it changed the entire conversation from, oh, this is a POS to this was designed with intention. And I understand why. And so they were absolutely cool about it. Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, I, I work in the 
you know, manufacturing side of the industry. And, you know, I got to say that, you know, you bring in, you know, certain engineers to certain discussions. And to your point, you know, they're such problem solvers and they're so process oriented. And I mean, they're the experts that come up with the solution. They understand it the best. So, you know, I think there's something to say about that, that technical, you know, engineering background, you know, as you get into to sales. So, you know, and, and Richard, I think about now like being in sales, you know, and 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 having exposure to all these technologies. Um, I wonder, you know, like how that opens up Mike's eyes too to, you know, what else is out there in the world to, that can help and treat these patients. Yeah, a hundred percent. And really just wanted to touch on something because you spoke about, you know, having that perspective around the engineering and then now you've got the perspective working with the providers who are there applying that technology. And, and of course, now as a, as a patient and an advocate, you've got this really rounded, blended experience. And so I guess the big question as well would be, do you see opportunity in terms of like what the industry as a whole can be doing to better support patients? Because this is ultimately what it's all about. Uh yeah, so uh, you know, with with terminal diseases, um, if you have something that is a hundred percent fatal, right, and with a standard of care, I it really bugs me that we have to wait 20, 30, 40 years to get access to that technology. Once it's already proven to be safe, it's like you know, why are we why are we going through and, and making multiple generations of these patients not be able to get access to this technology. And so I, I really think that, you know, they used to, they did the right to try kind of bill, which tried to solve that, which ultimately nobody really got. Um, they have expanded access programs. And I will, I can tell you that there has been people donating large sums of money to companies to let expanded access programs go. And I'm currently in a situation where I'm willing to spend the money, additional money. Someone donated a, ton to, a, a bunch of money for me and, and other patients as well. And I follow the, I fit the criteria where I could, you know, get this, but no one, nobody wants to do it because it's paperwork. It's a risk to, you know, with the FDA. So I've been advocating for a promising pathway app. And that, that promising pathway act is why I went to Congress and stuff like that. And, you know, I am very passionate about this, right? Because it's, it's kind of got my life's stance on it, right? Where we could potentially save my life. And I want to be the Magic Johnson of uh, glioblastoma. So I have to sit there in, in the Congress and listen to them say, we need placebos you know, we need placebos. And I'm like, man, I know that one plus one still equals two. And we're not comparing a hip or a knee versus the triathlon knee versus the, you know, Ironman knee, right? Where the solution's already pretty good, right? It's just refining it. That one, let's do standard of care. Let's do placebos with a different uh, device. But when you're talking, you're going to die if you use standard of care why are we signing people up for a placebo where we know the end results? And so that's what I've been advocating for. And hopefully with the promising pathway act, you know, we can change some things and, and allow iterations to be designed quicker, right? Let's fail quickly and, and make that solution. So that way we can all, you know, all live longer, whatever cancer, whatever disease you have. Yeah, absolutely, Mike. I think we can all get behind that bill. And of course, we hope that that comes to fruition. And and to your point, you know, again, innovation takes too long. It doesn't need to. We have so much amazing technology out in the world today. Um, maybe you could maybe share a little bit the audience about the technology you're tapping into right now um, and, and you know, how that works. Yeah, so I have a, it's a, it's called Optune and it creates an electrical field. And so the front and back and the side and side and basically, the technology is it disrupts the, the cell's ability to divide and grow. Um, the more you wear it, the more effective it is. And so I'm pretty competitive 
and they give a, at the end of the day, at the end of every month, they give you a percentage of use. And so the survival curve, and I, and I don't work for Novagear or anything, but I, I've seen the data in clinical studies. So the survival curve goes like this as you use the device more. And so knowing that and knowing, you know, the published data where you take four or 5% survival for five years up to 12.9%. And then if you use it over 90%, that goes to 29%. So I'm like, let's use it 99%, right? I mean, I have to take showers and I have to, you know, like change my arrays. But um, so that has been my last two years of as much as possible use this. And it's funny because when I first got it two years ago, you know, I, I know a lot of these neuro-oncologists. I know a lot of these radiation uh, oncologists. And, um, you know, basically they're saying, listen, uh, yeah, you could try it. it. It's okay, whatever. And by the end of the two years, they're saying, oh, everyone that's living longer is wearing the uh, Optune unit and, you know, Every I've always said that is the best product out there because it really is like even, you know, better data than the chemo and radiation. So uh, it's kind of changed in the last two years. And maybe it's because they keep seeing me alive at all these conference meetings. I go as a patient to uh, read the boards and all the different, um, you know, new things coming out because my wife is a genius and she kind of tells me, uh, hell yeah, this is what this means. I'm like, you know, big dumb animal. Okay. <laughs> you know, um, and everyone sees me walking around the conference. They think I'm a mop. They're like, oh, are you a model for, you know, Optune? Is that a real device? And <laughs> I keep laughing. I'm like, well, you think I'm good looking, huh? Uh, <laughs> you know, I'm like, uh, no, I'm not. But uh, I appreciate you go tell my wife that I'm, a, that you think I'm a model. You know? <laughs> And, uh, you know, especially because I'm doing so well and happy and energetic and, and stuff like that, they, they don't, they wouldn't know that I had uh, brain cancer if I wasn't wearing this. And that, that's because I had a great team of, of uh, healthcare professionals that worked with me. Yeah, those are some just, impressive stats. I was just going to say, like, if you pardon the pun, but I've never heard anything more of a no-brainer to wear this more often, <laughs> given those figures. I mean, it's a totally incredible technology. Yeah, and, and and that's why I feel compelled to help anybody. If they're on the fence, if they have glioblastoma, you know, they they may have seen me uh, from my Tim McCraw uh, duet or something. I went viral on that to, to make things for my, my kids. Um, you know, I get a lot of phone calls and we walk through, you know, what's your diet? What's your, you know, and I, I talked to between my wife and I, we probably talked to six or eight patients, uh, a week, you know, and, and just kind of help them point to resources and, and things like that. And, uh, it's, it's quite the blessing kind of fulfilling that need of, you know, helping the world of just a little bit. And so I'm, I'm thankful to be able to do that. And, and so you've been wearing um, Novacure's Optune uh, system here for, for a couple of years now. Are you at all involved to, um, in like the future development and iterations of this technology? Or is that something you might stay out of? I mean, I think the potential for this, you know, being an engineer, you can't help. Yeah. Say, oh man, especially, I mean, I sleep with this, I shower with this, I do everything. Right. And so, um, you know, you can't help but say, oh, this would be better and this would be better. Um, but for, for the most part, I would say um, I pretty much stay out of it. There are some things that I was trying to, you know, if you have a wheel, you want to put it on a trailer, you want to put it on a dirt bike, you want, you know, so there was definitely some opportunities for technology to, you know, progress and, and really make a difference in the world. So I kind of, I, I may have said, Hey, this would be a good option to look at to change the world. But I kind of stay back a little bit, uh, you know, try to partner Medtronic Novacure if I can, but at the end of the day, whatever is best for the patient to get the project done, 
I let the, I let it roll with that. Yeah. And you were telling us too, like, so it's like these electromagnetic fields. Um, and this is something that I think is really interesting just in general about the future of, of healthcare and medicine. But uh, and I don't even know if it actually relates to the whole bioelectronic medicine, but I think like um, just the ability to use electricity and energy to provide therapeutic outcomes, I think is is incredible, especially if it can mitigate and eliminate the need for a daily medication that might come with some pretty severe side effects. Um, you know, so I don't not so I don't suppose you can touch a little bit more on how exactly that that energy that electric electric field works. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I alluded can, to it, but I'm I'm just yeah. curious. I want to better understand too that technology. So uh, you know the a Apple Watch, right? And that's the easiest way I can relate to people, right? So you put this thing on the Apple Watch charger, or if you have the the cell phone where you can put it on the conductive charger. The, the technology is somewhat similar, right? I mean, if you talk to Novigur, they would probably say, no, don't ever say that. But it, <laughs> to me, I'm a big, dumb animal, right? So simple analogies, please, right? Yes, Everyday yeah. people need to understand this here. So, so if I put this phone <laughs> on one of those uh, chargers, right? Now, this is pretty thin, right? You can see it's how, how thin it is. It will not charge because the impedance of the electrical field gets taken down. So if you were able to get, you know, this thing kind of closer, millimeters, right? It mm -hmm. makes a huge difference. So, you know, obviously if you were to implant this or implant it, you know, it, it has been proven that electrical field at different frequencies to actually uh, work with a lot of solid tumors. Now, they have to do all these clinical studies. They got small cell lung cancer. They have brain cancer. But I mean, theoretically, pancreas, you know, liver, all these different opportunities where if you could implant, um, you know, it could make a huge difference. I mean, look at where, you, you know, Medtronic has been working with the deep brain stimulation, right, to, to help with Parkinson's patients, mm -hmm. um, epilepsy, right, where we read brain waves and send electricity. I, I think there is a huge opportunity in the our ability to use electrical and, and even sound frequencies and some of that stuff I, I've seen coming up where I think it's going to go there at some point. And once we see what can be untapped, I, I think it'll be really exciting. Yeah, I think you're quite right. And, and I think you know, we've obviously had a lot of guests on and thinking about neurobionics, Carl, that we had on recently, who've got exciting technology in this space. And so, you know, we can only hope that, as to Mike was saying earlier, we get this technology to market to patients faster. And, you know, Mike, one is as we round off this discussion, just thinking more about your advocacy work. And, and clearly you're out there doing a lot, as we've discussed, you know, raising awareness. You know, what are the other platforms you're tapping into where you're getting success in terms of really, you know, reaching out and, and informing people. So, so my wife uh, works for a foundation, Glioblastoma Foundation, and she does patient meetings. Uh, she does conference calls with all of these uh, really, really prestigious um, oncology programs, and you know, it's it's really like kind of wide open. We go to the neuro oncology um, meetings. She writes a you know, a blog about all the things that can impact patients today. So we have that, um, you know, I obviously went, uh, you know, viral on a, on a video. So a lot of people saw me on Good Morning America. You know, I did a really, I was trying to figure out something I could do for my kids. You know, I'm not sure if I was going to live very long. And uh, I made a nice duet video with Tim McGraw. And so a lot of people have seen me because if you look up glioblastoma, it kind of pops up as one of the um, upper things on, on Google. And so between the, the foundation, going to conferences and uh, our, my different work um, with even Medtronic, some of the reps, friends, or you know manufacturing friends, family, they call me and say, hey, point us in the right direction because we're just buried in information and all the information we look at 
makes us want to go lay down and cry. So, you know, they, I mean, that's a huge net. And from that, I get a lot of uh, takers and people that not just, I'm not just giving them information. Most of the people that are reaching out to me, they have their own resources as well, right? And so I feel like someone that's like gathering the information and then resharing it in a way that is helpful and actionable for the patients, right? Because we get a lot of information. It's like, yeah, that's great. What am I supposed to do with it? And so for, for you know, my wife and I, we're like, okay, that's great. What are we going to do with it? We'll, we'll keep watching that and from, you know, technology, we'll keep watching that. Hopefully it goes quickly, but at the same time, you can take this today. You can, you can wear this today. Right. And I had my surgery and it was a fantastic surgery. Right. And, and if you looked at my scan post-surgery, it was, you know, what they call like perfect, clear, you know, scan. And then I ate a bunch of ice cream because I was trained for Ironmans right before that, uh, ate a bunch of ice cream and got my mask for radiation done three weeks later. And the tumor was already a third of the size. It had grown back that quickly. And so in some ways it scared me into being intense and Hey, this is a really, really, really serious deal. You don't want to kind of fall behind on. Um, so I changed my diet, changed all these things. And as soon as I could get Optune, because we had seen the data on early use of Optune, as soon as we got done with radiation, we put this on and you could see it every week. It was like getting smaller and smaller and smaller. And now when we get the scans, it's, it's like, you can't really see anything other than scar tissue, which is, you know, for glioblastoma that has been that aggressive to grow back within three weeks. I mean, they're just floored. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Mike, you're changing the game at, in like patient advocates, advocacy, right? Like you are the epitome of a patient advocate and just curious, you know, how do you see that side of the world and industry kind of evolving and improving as a patient advocate? Well, you know, number one, it's a nice, uh, like a charity thing to do, right? So it's a, it's good company stewardship, right? Like they do, you know, donate to this, donate to that, whatever, but it, it has a real impact on patients. Right. And that, and that's ultimately what all the med tech world is about to take care of the patient. So instead of maybe donating to, I don't know, save the trees and which is a great thing. It's, it's really kind of awesome to donate and help save the patients that your world, you know, kind of revolves around. Right. And then on top of that, you get a lot of opportunities for, Hey, I see this technology as a great potential to, you know, a call point or something that's, you know, a shoot off of, of a area where we're already in. It's like, Oh, if you could tweak this just a little bit, then imagine the impact. And, and so being that I get to both meet with the, the advanced kind of world of science and, and scientists. And I also kind of take that to translate with patients, you know, when I see opportunities, when I, which I'm always looking, right. Cause it's almost like my life depends on it. <laughs> mm -hmm. And then I bring it up and I say, Hey, is this something that we could do? You know, maybe Medtronic can do, maybe we can sponsor, maybe it's just a charity thing, or maybe it's an investment. Uh, whatever that is, that's really kind of what I do, uh, whether it's the right thing to do or the perfect job kind of description and, and path to go, I don't, I don't know. And I'm sure I'll adapt and change when and where that's needed. But that's what I've been doing mostly for the past couple of years. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, just when you think about just being an engineer, working with doctors, understanding, again, the product, the technology best, um, being that real trusted source, uh, source to, the, to the doctor. And now you're that trusted source to other patients out there that knows the technology, you're going through it. You know, you've, you've treated yourself. I mean, again, there's no 
uh, better advocate than than you, Mike. So, um, you know, can't thank you enough for just everything you're doing here in this world. And um, uh, you're, you're a true blessing. So, um, and thank you, obviously, for coming on and sharing this story too. Yeah, no problem. Anything I could do if, if any users or, you know, listeners kind of have a good opportunity to, you know, save people and or if you have a, a loved one or, or family member or friend that does have glioblastoma, certainly I'm, I'm happy to try to point them in a, in a great resource and help where I can. So it's, it's, a, it's such a blessing, you know, remove that stress somewhat uh, from my life and just focus on doing good for the world. I love it. And, you know, you got, we do that all the time, right? In the med tech world, but sometimes we get so, you know, caught up with shipments, you know, quotas and, you know, he said, she said, right. And you forget that there's a patient on the other end of what you're doing and whether it's like a, you know, Bovi that helps with, you know, healing quicker and whatever that is, that's a there's a patient on the end of the, at the end of the day. And I didn't realize how much I value, for example, the fiber tracking, right? Mm -hmm. So that way, when they do the surgery and, you know, I'm playing, uh, you know, game of Uno against my girls, you know, I'm like, bam, oh, Uno, <laughs> you know, and uh, they beat me yesterday pretty bad. <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> I'm I'm a little I'm a little bitter about it, you know. The seven and nine year old have already taken me down, the champ. Uh, <laughs> but they still haven't got me in Mario Kart. So well, I was gonna say, as long as you're still winning in Mario Kart. Yeah, when they get that blue uh, turtle, I just smoke them in the when they're in the front with no regrets, you know. <laughs> so they're, you know, my seven year old looks at me like, really, you gotta do that? And I'm like, yeah, no freeloaders, you know. <laughs> They're raising them right. I love it, Mike. <laughs> yeah. Mike, honestly, again, thank you so much. I mean, there's a little quote I wanted to share from Marcus Aurelius. Really you know, waste no more time arguing what a good man should be, be one. And you truly are the embodiment of that. So, you know, just a huge thank you for all you do. Uh, and yeah, a huge thank you for coming on and sharing your story with the listeners today. Yeah, no, no. That's uh, one of my favorite quotes as well. I got a, I got it in the meditations book and I love that. And that's what I try to do, but I certainly am, uh, am, am human and I fall short of what I want to do, but, uh, you know, that's what we all get up in the morning and, and do our best. So that is a huge compliment to me and I really appreciate it, Richard. Uh, and I'll keep striving to be that good, you know, that good person the best I can. So thank you. And thank you guys, both Kyle, uh, Richard for, for getting this information out there and helping people. Awesome. Well, thank you. And another huge thank you to Mike Hugo, patient advocate at Medtronic Neuroscience Division. And thank you for tuning in to another episode of the MedTech Impact Podcast. I'm Kyle Cruz. And I'm Richard Bickeljohn. Until next time, keep advocating.